Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet and our world. My guests are economists, scientists, politicians, academics, activists and journalists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, ecological, political, democratic crises that we are facing today. They reveal what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. This is a critical time for our planet. It demands critical thinking. Click the subscribe button now and go to planetcritical.com to learn more. My guest this week is Catherine Stewart, investigative reporter and author of The Power Worshippers, Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism. I am extremely grateful to Catherine. Uh, she joined me with like an hour's notice to discuss the overruling of Roe versus Wade uh, and what it's actually about, the fact that it's not a pro-life movement, it is a pro-power movement. She explains how the far-right religious movement have spent the past five decades organizing, strategizing, getting their people into education, into government, onto boards, creating think tanks, creating legal advisory organizations in order to claw back power from a progressive culture to enact their vision of white Christian nationalism on the USA. And how did they do that? Well, they had a meeting and they went through all the social issues to try and find their hook and they landed on abortion. I'm sure you can all hear in my voice, I am absolutely furious about last week's ruling. I am not shocked that it did happen. Uh, we knew the minute the leak was out that it would happen. I am just shocked that it could happen in 2022. If we are not clawing ourselves into the future, we are slipping back into the past. That is what we should learn from last week's ruling. And this is the very beginning of their bid to reclaim power. What that means for the climate, for the environment, for social equality, well, it doesn't take much of an imagination to figure it out. Everything Catherine has to say today should be eye-opening and terrifying, and I implore everybody to go and get a copy of her book. Please also share this episode to your network, and if you're finding value in Planet Critical, support it at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. And thank you to the Planet Critical community who keeps this project going. Thank you so much for jumping on at such last minute. I mean, it's 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 so important that we start sort of you know getting the the information that you've investigated out. Well, I mean, you're doing great at getting out into the world, but you know what I mean. Like it is just, I'm so shocked by last week's decision. Well, you know, no issue has been more um, effective in mobilizing the religious right in America than abortion. It's really been the focus of a lot of their messaging. It's the way the Movement leaders really have messaged to the rank and file in order to get them to vote a certain way. You know, they know very well if they can get people to vote on a single issue, you can control their vote. So they've really devoted enormous energy and tools not into just sort of um, telling people that this is the most important uh, issue they should vote on, but also in shaping the issue itself and getting everybody on board with the pro, um, the anti-abortion agenda. Uh, and it's really surprising because for many years, most Protestant Republicans uh, supported some form of abortion uh, access. Mm -hmm. In fact, most Americans, a, a, a very clear majority of Americans support um, a, a, a broad array of, of situations in which abortion access should be legal. So, um, so it's, uh, it's really become that, um, that issue that that movement has used to turn out their people to vote in disproportionate numbers. Where, where did this start? Um, because obviously the Supreme Court overruling Roe v. Wade um, last week did not begin last week. I mean, did this start with Trump? How has the movement mobilized? How is it different now to pre-Roe v. Wade? Because this is obviously not about life. This is about control. Where are the roots of this movement? Well, the, the according to the story that America's religious right would like us to believe uh, the movement sort of shot up as a grassroots reaction uh, in 1973 to the Supreme Court decision of Roe versus Wade, um, which uh, gave constitutional right uh, to uh, um, abortion access and um, right to privacy in these medical decisions. Um, but um, this origin story is really a myth. Uh, in and uh, before 1979, abortion was neither a clearly partisan issue nor a vital religious issue. It really didn't reliably deny, uh, uh, divide uh, Republicans from Democrats. 
nor did it divide the faithful faithful from the secular. It mm. was uh, abortion was an issue that um, that was largely seen as a Catholic issue, but it also accompanied a lot of policies at the time that were considered to be more socially progressive, uh, concerned for the poor and things like that. It wasn't at all associated uh, with a, a broad position that the Republican Party was embracing. Mm -hmm. And um, evangelical Protestants, by and large, dismissed the issue. So when the Roe versus Wade uh, decision was announced in 1973, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, which is a was a major uh, Protestant denomination, evangelical denomination at the time. They actually plotted the issue. Wow. They um, issued statements in 1971 and 1974, uh, is issuing support for uh, expansion of abortion rights. In 1973, uh, a, wow. a, a, an editorial appeared in their wi wire service, uh, applauding Roe versus Wade, and they said it was you know sensible middle ground. That's that's what they thought. I mean. Think about all the prominent Republicans at the time who supported it. You know, Betty Ford hailed it as a great, great decision. Barry Goldwater, who had been a, a terrific uh, conservative hero to a lot of these Protestant Republicans, he supported abortion rights early in his career, at least, and his wife Peggy co-founded Planned Parenthood in Arizona. I mean, you can't imagine a, wow. a conservative leader today whose mm. wife is actually a uh, pro-choice activist to that mm. level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But... Mm -hmm. What happened was there was a rise of a new movement called um, the New Right. They called themselves the New Right. Um, they consisted of people like Paul Weyrich, Richard Vigory, Phyllis Schlafly, who was animated at least earlier in her career, not by the abortion issue, but by hostility to communism, uh, Alan Dye and many others. And they drew in representatives of um, conservative religion, people like uh, Bob Jones and Jerry Falwell. And they were concerned about a variety of issues. Uh, among them, um, well, they were felt the Republican Party had become too liberal, too soft on communism. They were very worried about the civil rights movement and mm. it's the threat it posed to segregation in America. They were very concerned about the women's rights movement and what they saw as a threat to gender order. Um, and uh, but you know they needed an issue that would draw in the rank and file to their new movement. And the thing that really got these pastors upset was the fact that the IRS was starting to look at some of their schools, which were racially segregated. They racially segregated their schools. I mean, Bob Jones called segregation Bob's uh, God's established order. And uh, um, uh, folks like uh, Billy Graham had also delivered sermons where they basically agreed with this type of perspective. Mm. And they wanted to ignite a hyper-conservative counter-revolution, but they knew um, that sort of stop the tax on segregation wasn't, it's such an ugly thought, isn't it? Like yeah. um, this open embrace of racial segregation and the idea that, you know, uh, God has, you know, supposedly different purposes for different uh, groups of people based on their skin color. So they needed a popular issue, but they knew that, you know, um, the sort of issue of supporting segregated schools, wasn't it? So they had this meeting as a, the historian Rand Randall Balmer, who was very close to members of this movement, has described it as they had, had meetings where they sort of went through the issues, went sort of down a list of the issues to try and figure out what issue they could use to um, bring the rank and file together and oh. get them behind this movement. And and it, when they got to the issue of abortion, it wasn't the obvious issue. It wasn't the first issue, but it was like a light bulb went off. And they were like, huh, that might work. Mm -hmm. So it was only over time that they were able to uh, purge the Republican Party of its pro-choice voices. And there were a lot of them. And the process actually took a long time to do. And it took a lot of effort. And Phyllis Schlafly, who was this very important activist in this movement, she and uh, she actually wrote a book about this process. It's called How the Republican Party Became Pro-Life. It was published, I believe, in 2016. But what it shows right before she died, but, you know, what it shows is that this process took many years and it, it was it took an awful lot of effort. And, and what it shows is that the sort of pro-choice, uh, sorry, pro, you know, priority of um, quote unquote life that we see today, which is the Republican Party, 
as they've sort of branded themselves a party of life. It's really a modern creation, and it was created for political purposes. How fascinating. You know, the thing that came to my mind there when you said they landed on abortion as an issue, I, I remember, uh, I, I can't remember what documentary it was in, but it was somebody revealing how uh, when Trump was campaigning, it was the exact same thing. It was like, right, we need to find something that can really get people angry. And so they were using Twitter to kind of A-B test different um, issues. And it was it was his tweet about, um, you know, building a wall that went viral. And that's how they decided that they would build their campaign around. And look at the kind of America Absolutely. that it's created. It's true. I mean, um, Trump, or Trump racked up a higher percentage of white evangelical voters than either Romney or Bush, mm. an astounding 81% to Clinton's 16%. Um, and 21% of voters said that Supreme Court appointments was the most important factor in deciding their vote. Uh, and a like, clear majority of those went for Trump. So in other words, one quarter of Trump's 59 million voters picked him for the sake of getting an anti-abortion Supreme Court. But, you know, I've been, you know, I've, I've been researching and writing about this movement for over 12 years. Um, mm. I, uh, my latest book, The Power Worshippers Inside the Dangerous Rise of Religious Nationalism, is really an inside look at the movement that brought Trump to power. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the I do my research is by going to strategy meetings and gatherings of the religious right leadership. And in advance of 2016, many of these leaders would stand up there and say, this is abortion. I'm uh, sorry, this selection is about judges, judges, judges. And then they talk about, you know, his um, pro-choice, uh, pro dedication to anti-abortion, um, you know, the anti-abortion movement as a cause. And, you know, I've attended things like Marches for Life and Americans United for Life gatherings, these sort of anti-abortion gatherings in America. And Trump will stand up there or his representatives and say, you know, I, I think I gave you everything you wanted. And in fact, I think you, I gave you more. And he's right. He gave this movement everything they wanted. Mm. Anti-abortion judges, when, when, it's, when you say they're not just anti-abortion, you know, that sort of becomes code for a whole panoply of sort of far right you know, positions, not just in the culture wars, but also in terms of economic policy, foreign policy, gun policy, yeah, yeah and yeah, things yeah. like that. Um, and he also, you know, promised very explicitly pro-life, quote unquote, pro-life judges at, at meetings with um, large numbers of pastors in advance of the election, of the 2016 election. And he gave them everything they wanted, you know, three Supreme Court judges, uh, over 230 um, federal judges, appellate courts, et cetera. So he really um, transformed the judiciary and he chose people that were representing this kind of certain far right kind of ideological uh, uh, perspective. So that this is obviously about power. This is obviously about, you know, plutocrats and kleptocrats and in the face of Trump, you know, oligarchs kind of banding together in a, in a bid to grab onto power and using religion as a vehicle for that to essentially, you know, preach to the very people that they are harming um, to make, to, to vote for the policies and the people that will harm them. But what is their vision for the future? What is it that they are trying to sell? Where do you think they they want to push the United States towards? Obviously, there's been a lot of um, parallels drawn between what's going on right now and The Handmaid's Tale, Ad, Atwood's sort of seminal feminist text. Um, is I mean, is there truth to that? Well, so there's a lot to unpack here. And I want to start yeah. by talking about the plutocrats and the oligarchs. I mean, look, mm. there are many very wealthy people in America who are absolutely opposed to this vision. Mm -hmm. Um, but the right on the right, um, they are much more, and yes, the movement is funded to a large degree by a certain sector of, uh, you know, I'll say oligarchs, uh, a lot of the funding, uh, for the movement comes from these very wealthy, uh, often, um, extended families like the, um, the DeVos Prince families, the Wilkes brothers, and so many others that I, uh, discuss in my book, the power worshippers. They're more organized. They're more um, they uh, they're 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 more focused with their political donations, mm -hmm. and um, and the reason for that is that the movement has invested in infrastructure over many decades. Uh, so the the money is um, is is used uh, 
very efficiently. A lot of it is coordinated, for instance, through groups like the Council for National Policy. This is um, a, an organization that is one of the key networking organizations of the movement. It brings together leaders of key pieces of the movement infrastructure, like the legal advocacy groups, like the Federalist Society and the Alliance Defending Freedom, the policy groups, the like the um, heritage uh, or groups like the Family Research Council. It brings together heads of their key uh, features of um, the media organizations, uh, leadership training organizations, mm. um, legislative initiatives, and things like that. And it brings together uh, them with the, the some of the key donors of the Christian right, uh, some of those very hyper-wealthy extended families that we talked about. And it gets the movement leadership on the same page and it brings them together with donors who can actually fund the initiatives that they want to um, to to start in order to further the aims of their larger movement. Um, uh, Betsy DeVos, our, uh, Trump's former education secretary, her father-in-law was deeply involved in the Council for National Policy. He said it brings together the, quote, doers and the donors of the Christian right. Jeez. So that is... Um, uh, one of the ways in which they coordinate their efforts and make mm -hmm. it um and 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 make it very uh and make it so as powerful as it is and on the other side you really don't have anything along those same lines i mean this is a movement that has a tremendous amount of power precisely because it has invested in all the infrastructure of modern political campaigns over decades mm -hmm. right-wing policy groups legal advocacy groups legislative initiatives uh, networking organizations, leadership training initiatives, a sort of vast media sphere, propaganda sphere that mm -hmm. uh, has a terrific job of separating the rank and file from the facts, which makes them much easier to control and directing their kind of political messaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why they have the power that they do. So um, I also think, you know, precisely for this reason, when you look at the infrastructure as the key to the strength of this movement, it really makes sense when you look at the movement broadly to separate the rank and file from the leadership. So when you're talking about the rank and file, you're mm -hmm. talking about people like a very wide array of people with different concerns and backgrounds, uh, different sort of ethnic backgrounds. And, and frankly, it's very, um, you know, there's, it's sort of multi-denominational. You have uh, a number of evangelicals, but the movement also repels some evangelicals too. And it would be nowhere without the involvement of a cadre of hyper-conservative Catholics. Um, the movement um, even draws in the support of some people who do not identify as Christian at all. Mm. Um, and, and it repels a lot of Christians. So it's a multi-denominational effort, even though there's some concentration, um, larger concentrations among different religious groups. Um, so that's the rank and file. But when you're talking about the leadership, you know, what they want. So they want um, a lot more power uh, and, and political access than they've had in the past, and they're mm -hmm. getting it. Mm -hmm. So they want power and political access. They want access to public money, and they're getting right. that too. That's something that Trump promised them, you know, opening the doors of um, the flow of public money to their uh, churches and their organizations through all these different means. Um, and, um, you know, the, those are, and they want policies that pr favor certain quote unquote approved religious perspectives and groups and they're getting those as well can i jump in and ask a, a question here uh because i think what is so interesting is how like polarization has become sort of the focus of um the well i mean the entire argument even in sort of the fallout over the past few days since roe versus wade and um, there's been this I think very necessary analysis of like this isn't about being pro-life this is about power and control over women's bodies but I mean, mm -hmm. I kind of want to add another layer on top of that with everything that you're saying. I mean, is it about power and control over women's bodies or is it about also about these people, I don't know, um, having access to the to the things that they want and because abortion is the the issue that they fell upon, like this is sort of the extremist route that they are using to push forward towards their... Well, I don't know, are they ethno-nationalists or are they really just kind of obsessed with um, amassing their own wealth and power and resources? Do you know, do you, 
it's not a great question, I'm afraid. But it's, you know, it's it, it, that's a these are um well, there are a lot of different strands to pick out here. Mm. Um, yes, it's about enforcing um a certain vision of um of the family in gender relations, and they think that um limiting abortion is going to achieve that. But it's also about much broader issues, a range of issues, and they know that if you can get people to vote on a single issue, if you can get them to support this issue, they will support a whole bunch of other issues. I mean, what's yeah. very clear to them is that this is not, they're not ending their battle with Roe versus Wade. They see this as just the beginning. They've mm. said very explicitly that they're going to take the battle to all 50 states. I was at this year's National Ameri uh, Americans, uh, I think it's called Americans United for Life. No, that was, I'm sorry, it was a National Pro-Life Summit. That's it. Mm -hmm. It was in uh, D.C. this year. And one of the movement leaders, Christian Hawkins, said, you know, let me tell you what the agenda is. I'm paraphrasing a bit here. She said, mm. we want to introduce a um, constitutional amendment banning abortion in all 50 states, but that's going oh to take some time. Oh, my God. A leader from the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is uh, one of the key legal advocacy groups of the uh, religious right, um, said very much the same thing. So they really want to ban abortion completely. They see this as a key for enforcing a certain type of morality. I mean, if they were really concerned, <laughs> truly, about um, ending abortion, they would hail advances in long-acting birth control. They wouldn't insist mm. on characterizing abortion as something that from the moment of fertilization, this is purely a religious idea. I mean, every doctor's and you know medical association says it uh, pregnancy begins with implantation, not fertilization, but they mm. characterize it as fertilization because no one knows if and when um, the fertilization occurs and a very significant number of fertilizations do not implant. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, they, this, they outlaw, you know, from the moment of fertilization, that means outlawing long acting birth control, anything yeah. involving hormones like, um, I'm not a doctor. I don't know uh, the specifics of each uh, method of birth control, but as it's been explained to me, it's you know long birth um, birth control pills, um, uh, long acting various forms of long acting birth control and um, IUDs. So I mean, if you really didn't want abortion, you would hail those uh, advances. And yet, the policies that the religious right has been pursuing, um, which are eroding healthcare for um, all Americans in, in many different ways actually impede the access to these types of long-acting birth control. It's really not about stopping abortions. You know, mm. it's really, um, you know, I mean, they, I think that members of the movement truly believe it is, like they've been sort of inculcated to believe it, but they, they also endorse these types of um, measures, broader measures affecting healthcare and birth control access that would seem to be at cross purposes with what they claim they want to do. So it's really about a broader method of um, social control. You know, if you can get people engaged in that sort of anti-abortion struggle. Look, I mean, look at all the Supreme Court decisions that came down last week. One of them had to do with vastly expanding uh, guns, the mm. gun rights. Um, another one had to do with uh, vastly expanding uh, uh, access um, religious access to public money, the Carson versus Macon decision, which mandated that the state of Maine has to give money to religious schools, uh, yeah. which is, this is a, a very radical decision in America. I mean, yeah. because we've had separation of church and state over and over, different religious groups have asked for public money to fund their schools and have been roundly denied over many, many uh, decades. And yet now all of a sudden, this is, I mean, a a, a decision as radical, frankly, in, in, in its way as overturning Roe versus Wade. I think what's frightening uh, about this is also, you know, that they're, they're just going to become increasingly emboldened as they sort of get away with it. And they're, as you said, there is no opposition in the sense of that they are so uh, well organized and have invested for so long in the different kinds of infrastructure. I mean, you know, in your book, it's about, you know, they, they put people on education boards, you know, they're sort of strategizing and um, inculcating masses of, of people and leaders. Um, so what can the left do now? Because I think something that's really interesting over the past weekend that I've been thinking about as well since the overturning is sort of this sudden bloody recognition, 
which a critical race theorists have been hammering on about, and apparently I hadn't been paying enough attention, that sort of modernity or equality or progressiveness is, has not been the natural order of our history. Um, and social evolution just does not happen just because the years go by. It's because people fight for it. The question is, what is to be done? What is to be done? Exactly. Listen, mm. when the new right was founded, they really felt like the culture was not going in their direction, right? They felt like religion had become itself too liberal. Uh, very popular leaders at the time, like Paul Tillich and, and Niebuhr, they were more uh, Protestant uh, liberals. They were very social justice oriented. This is after Vatican II, let's not forget. And some of the Catholic uh, leaders that they partnered with, people like Richard John Newhouse and George Weigel, felt like Catholicism had become too liberal. I mean, they really mm. felt the culture was going in the wrong direction. And they, they sat back and they strategized about how to change things over time. And this was back in the late 1970s. And only now we're really seeing the real consequences of that strategy. But, you know, there's a, one of the movement leaders that I wrote a lot on, about in my book, The Power Worshippers. His name is David Barton. Um, and he is um, a sort of one of the pseudo historians of the religious right who sort of crafted an alternate vision of American history that the movement needs to pursue their agenda, right? So mm -hmm. I call him the, the weird Waldo of the of the movement because he's sort of everywhere he pops up on all these different places. But yeah. he said years ago something really stuck with me. He said, you know, arm yourself with the mentality of a long distance runner, not a sprinter. And I mm. think that that kind of advice is really important to remember right now. Um, we're too used to thinking, oh, what's the one trick we can do? And what's the one little messaging thing we can do to turn the ship around? How can we turn this around in the next election cycle? And I think we need to do what they did, which mm. is invest over time in all of the um, features of, um, of, of democratic infrastructure. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't uh, think, well, we're just going to turn it all around in 1984. They really, in, you know, created these organizations that would work almost like, um, uh, to engage people in the political process, and they turned out the vote in disproportionate numbers. I mean, Ralph Reed, who's one of the most sort of seasoned and astute uh, activists of this movement, he said, pay no attention to the polls. All that matters is who turns out on election day. And he's right. So I just want to give you an example of that. Yeah. In a country where 40 to 50 percent of people don't bother to turn out to vote, all, you don't need a majority of the population to dominate in election cycles. All you need is a, a disproportionately organized number of people, minority of people who, who vote in disproportionate numbers. So mm. the evangelical pollster George Barna, who's very much a part of this movement, he said in 2016, the most devoted religious rights supporters numbered only 10% of the population, um, but they voted 91% to adopt vote. <sighs> And wow. 93 percent of those were Trump, and the numbers were even higher in 2020. And it wasn't at the time enough to tip the scales, but in 2016 it certainly was. So when you get that small number of people voting in such vastly mm. disproportionate numbers, then you've got this other side that you know some people don't vote, or they don't think voting really matters. They think their votes don't matter. It that's how they able to they're able to win. And I think the message that voting matters is so important. And a lot of people have been seeing people say, oh, people are telling us to vote in November. That's not enough. And it's like, of course it's not enough. You should be working between now and November to turn mm. out the vote. Because mm. unless we can turn out enough folks who reject these politics of division and conquest, we're going to lose every time. So in, investing in voting rights, um, investing in you know uh, any kind of organization that's holding those to account for trying to steal the vote through gerrymandering, voter suppression tactics, or simply just dismissing the consequences of elections they don't like. I mean, they're working right now with the authoritarian playbook, you know, saying that if an you know, election doesn't go their way, mm. it's, um, it, it's illegitimate. But for many years, they were working with the tools of democratic political culture, um, and, and, and we need to use those tools as well. Well, let, let's talk about having equal opposing force as well in media. 
Uh, because another thing we've seen is that uh, a number of media institutions sent out emails to their staff saying, you know, please don't publicize your opinion on this ruling uh, because we need to be seen to be objective and unbiased and da 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 da. And like objectivity and the lack of bias is sort of uh, a key cornerstone, supposedly. Um, of a free and democratic press. And yet in a nation where you have crazy news channels like Fox News publicizing absolute nut jobs um, and their radical opinions, do we not need to do the same on the left, essentially? Do we not need to come out stronger as journalists and say, do you know what? No, I do have this opinion. Um, and it's important that you know that I have this opinion because I need to infuse my investigations and my writing with this opinion in order to kind of go against the tidal wave of rhetoric from the right. Yeah, you know, I see a lot of opinion journalism <laughs> <laughs> and I you know, write a lot uh, uh, on this issue. I frankly don't um, hold back on my opinions and I yeah. um, am a lot of other you know, I'm very well aware of the work of other journalists who don't. And, you know, I can't speak to the need of you know, certain media organizations to uh, separate their news from their uh, opinion sections. And you can often find a news outlets that will do that. They'll have very um, robust opinion sections and then they'll have news sections. I can't sort of, I'm not part of, um, you know, I don't have a staff job, so I can't really speak to that. Um, but um, I think when you're talking about Fox News, it's really unfortunate that one of our major media networks has basically been turned into a right wing part of the right wing disinformation machine. I think it's mm. incredibly toxic to our politics. And um and uh yeah, I think it's a problem. I just it's something I wonder I I often wonder about in terms of uh the the climate crisis that whether our reporting on the crisis um objectively is enough when given all of the information that one has as a journalist that's been investigating something for a while, like you 12 years, like the amount of information and expertise that you would have would surely infuse any sort of objective news reporting rather than the opinion pieces. And are we not getting to a stage in terms of sort of the political war and the culture war where we need to have, um, Fox is presenting opinion as news. Do we not need that on the left? You know, it's interesting what you're saying about uh, the climate crisis. Um, I sort of just got derailed thinking about that because <laughs> it's very difficult for people to wrap their heads around it. And it's the same thing when people think about the religious right. I think mm. part of the problem, you know, one of the biggest impediments for our, to us in understanding the crisis that we're facing um, in terms of our politics is that the right is exploiting religion yeah. Uh, to yeah. destroy our democracy. Yeah. And, but because it's religion, most Americans want to leave it to that sort of private realm. We all want to be respectful of one another's faith. Mm. Um, nobody wants to be perceived as being intolerant of anyone else's religion. And the right will stand up and say, this is my religion, this is my religion. But in reality, they're really exploiting religion for political purposes. Mm -hmm. And you even saw that back in the late 1970s, the movement arose in part because they really objected to um, the policies of Jimmy Carter, who was a, in a way a model of a certain type of evangelical. No one could call him uh, and uh, say, accuse him of not being a Christian. He was incredibly sincere in his religious beliefs. And yet they found his political views abhorrent Mm. Um, and that's one of the reasons they were so determined to, you know, make sure he didn't have a second term and came together uh, and, and engaged in politics. And the same is true today. I mean, among the most um, forceful targets of this, you know, most um, hated targets of this movement are people on the religious left or religious progressives. In fact, I I was recently, two weeks ago, at the Road to Majority Conference in Tennessee. It's a, an annual right-wing uh, gathering of movement strategists and leaders and, um, and, and very prominent politicians that are allied with the movement. Uh, Trump spoke at that event. Hmm. And um, I was, you know, a number of people spoke about how our churches are being taken over by, you know, the you know, satanic spirit, blah, 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 blah. Get, you know, the, that, that type of language being wow. used. And it was basically used to discredit um, uh, faith organizations that don't subscribe to these types of political views. Yeah. 
So that's a bit of a digression, but, you know, I thought mm -hmm. about like, what are the impediments to our understanding and grasping this movement? Um, um, that's certainly one of them. Well, I, it just strikes me that, you know, you use the word exploitative and I mean, the world is kind of split into the exploiters and the exploited and to be able to just, I don't know, I, I kind of worry that we're, we, our press exists in a sort of alternate reality. Uh, where we pretend that the world is equal enough to begin with to objectively report on things and then allow an educated uh, public to make up their minds. Um, when we're seeing time and time again, that is just not the case because the world does seem to be run by an, a group, different groups of exploitative people um, who wish to exploit the, the majority for their own gains. You're speaking really generally and yeah. um, I'm just trying to bring this, you know, trying to see how this is relevant to like i just think frankly a lot of people who are tasked with reporting on some of these issues don't mm -hmm. know a lot about the issues themselves and mm -hmm. um um so we're really kind of poorly educated about in in america about religious nationalism in general and the yeah. groups behind it i had a friend who used to work with um the leonard leo uh, at the federalist society who um which is one of the um leading uh, groups behind the sort of right-wing capture of the courts right. and um they like for instance all six uh conservative supreme court justices today are either current or former members of the federalist society or associated with them in some way right. and over 90 percent trump's you know 230 some picks had some connection to the federal society um, so it's an incredibly powerful legal organization with a sort of strong hyper-conservative bent. And um, this this uh, fellow th that I know went, you know, to talk to some of the reporters at the, who are, he lives close to the Supreme Court and, um, you know, went to, you know, talk to some of the reporters who were uh, reporting on the sort of demonstrations at the Supreme Court. And asked a number of them, do you know what the federal society is? And many of them said no. And I think that's shocking. How can yeah. you be tasked with understand with writing about the Supreme Court decision? Yeah. Dobbs out, which overturned, um, you know, Roe versus Wade, without knowing what the federal society is, without yeah. knowing who Leonard Leo is. I yeah. think that it's just hard for people to, um, to write um, effectively about uh, about something unless they know what they're looking at. And part of the yeah. problem has been over time that people don't want to look at religion because it, most of us still think of it as existing in that private realm. And, and frankly, it would be a nicer world if we could talk about policy and, and engage in politics without having to sort of, um, without in, it involving that private realm in such critical ways. But Absolutely. as long as, you know, there is a movement in yeah, in our country that's bent on exploiting um, e exploiting religion for political purposes. Thank you. You've extrapolated precision from my sort of general sweeping statement. What is so obvious and so important about you've been on this beat for 12 years, you've been reporting on it, um, you know the names, you know the connections, you've revealed things, you've uncovered things in your investigation and therefore you can you don't have to take anything that this sort of group says at face value. And that is why journalists like you are so important. And yet, if we have a kind of culture, I think, of sort of claiming, I don't know, um, that objectivity can exist, and then reporters are sent out to cover conferences, as you say, um, where they don't know the history of what they're reporting on, or they don't have any kind of expertise, and it kind of feeds into um, whatever potential line is being peddled by a very dangerous group of organized people, it seems to me. I do, I do want to note that I think that people who, you know, I see at these conferences, they really do um, uh, have their beliefs sincerely. Yeah. They, um, they believe uh, in their religion as, you know, uh, sincerely as anyone else. Yeah. But what you can see over time is the leadership has manipulated um, some of the views. They, you know, purged as, uh, you know, purged the Republican Party of pro-choice voices. And um you know, the fact that Schlafly wrote that book, you know, she sort of gets into the weeds about how it happened. Mm. So it's, um, it's, uh, you know, those views have been shaped over time and, um, the sort of, um, sort of, uh, takeover 
of of the Republican Party by this movement is a consequence of that. I think this is a a movement that for a long time the Republican Party thought they could make use of because mm-hmm. they deli- delivered a re- reluctant slice of votes. So mm-hmm. the Republican Party thought, you know, okay, let's make use of them. But they really kept a lot of the um, extremism out of the center of their party. And unfortunately, um, it's really uh, now it dominates the Republican Party. And, you know, when you go to these meetings, a lot of the leaders will will say that if if the if the, you know, Republican leaders don't embrace their most extreme positions, they will run someone to their right. And they talk about the resource that they're going to devote to run someone to their right in primaries. They'll primary them by someone who's even more to the right of them. And it really shows how the Republican Party has been um, drawn off into a really radical position. And almost kind of held hostage in a sense as well. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. Oh, my God. Remember, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the National Call Life Summit, um, Christian Hawkins was actually speaking about, I believe it was Ron DeSantis, this was before he embraced some radical anti-abortion uh, law or something. And she said, you know, we're, we're, you know, not sure how, she said something to the effect of, you know, we're not sure how it's going to go. He better, you know, do, uh, I'm paraphrasing, do what we want. Otherwise, we're going to, you know, not support him and, you know. And uh, sure enough, you know, they exerted pressure on him and he apparently did what they wanted and em- embraced that law. I can't remember the details, but, you know, sometimes when you see Republican politicians embracing forcefully these like really radical and extreme laws, this is why the movement is, yeah. you know, committed to um, forcing them to do it or running someone uh, against them who will do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I assume that they are aiming to get Trump back in power in the next election. You know, we can't sort of predict the future. Um, mm-hmm. He did show up at the, um, at the Road to Majority conference and was hailed like, you know, the return of a hero. Mm-hmm. But um, there are other contenders. You know, it's um, I think, uh, you know, DeSantis is another movement favorite. OK, so it's really hard to know how it's going to play out in the future. The thing that I want to take us back to is like the very, very beginning, actually, of this conversation as we wrap up. And it's about polarization. It's about the issues that split into black and white uh, thinking. How can, um, how can the public right now withstand um, the polarizing effect of this debate, the emotional effect of this debate? I mean, I'm sure you, like me, felt such fury um when we got the news on uh friday saturday um how can especially the left withstand that polarizing effect to be able to point fingers at the leaders in the shadows um and begin to mobilize and organize an effective tactical uh, strategic response uh to their vision for white christian christian nationalism i think we have to um uh, we have to remember that, um, you know, in the broad sweep of history, things sort of, you know, there's progress and then there's, um, you know, regress hmm. and take a long view and, and remember that, um, you know, change takes time, um, and not get demoralized. I mean, I think of the words of someone like Stacey Abrams, who said, you know, I'm neither, uh, optimistic nor pessimistic. I'm determined. Hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that 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 kind of determination is is really important. I mean, this is something that the right is very good at doing with their people. You yeah. know, they you know they knew in the beginning that they were going to try a lot of different things, and there were going to be some things that worked and others that didn't. But that it was really important to take the long view, and we need to do that as well. All right. Excellent. What a fantastic note to end on. Catherine, thank you so much for your time, uh, for jumping on at such short notice and squeezing me in. I so appreciate you coming on Planet Critical and explaining this very complex um, reality to to me and to the listeners. No, it's really a pleasure to connect. And thank you so much. Really appreciate your help. No, my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you want to learn more about Catherine's work and her books, I've put links to both over on planetcritical.com where you can subscribe to support this podcast. Please share this episode as far and wide as you can. And if you're finding value in Planet Critical, 
Support the project with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com or on Patreon. A huge thank you to the Planet Critical community who keep this project going. And thank you everyone for listening. I'll see you next week.